So welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for who are participating in this morning's event. Our community, our community and the nation continue to face challenging times, although we may be in a bit, little bit better spot than we were last year. We had really wanted to see you all in person. However, we had some real positive feedback for holding these sessions uh, virtually again this year. This is our 16th year for hosting Crossing Guard training workshops. The content is developed in partnership with a number of cities in the Phoenix metropolitan area. We hope this will provide a flexible and accessible means for training crossing guards now and throughout the year. Staff at the agencies made this workshop possible, including Glendale, Peoria, and the city of Phoenix. I would like agency staff to indicate the city they represent in the chat box now so attendees know who is available for questions, if there are any. I don't think there are at this point. Okay, we'll move on. So MAG is an association made up of all cities, towns, and Native American communities in the Phoenix metropolitan area. It includes all of Maricopa County and some parts of Pinal County as well. MAG is responsible for regional planning in many areas. Two key areas are transportation, so for freeways, light rail, buses, as well as clean air. In our role as regional agency for Phoenix metropolitan region, we are working with all cities and towns and counties in our planning region to improve road safety. Improving road safety on access routes to schools has been identified as a regional priority. This workshop and materials provide basic education and training to school crossing guards, thus meeting a basic but essential step to ensure crossing guards do not compromise their own safety nor that of, the of their children while performing their duties. So some virtual workshop instructions, uh, as Chris noted, uh, when we opened up here, we request that all attendees remain muted during this meeting to provide a positive experience for all attendees. Please use the chat function to ask any questions. To begin Spanish translation, please select the globe logo at the bottom of your screen as circled in this image, then select Spanish and mute original audio in order to hear the Spanish translator. You can see that here in yellow at the bottom. After the Guardians of the Future video, we are separating into three groups. All attendees will be automatically placed in a breakout room. Please remain in this breakout room until the end of the training session. You will, you will see three presentations. After the third presentation, you will be brought back into the main room automatically. So just a quick note, uh, the handbook that's typically provided at the in-person trainings is also available for viewing to download at the uh, URL you see here um, at srts.azmag.gov. We hope that you enjoy this workshop and gain much from this experience as you prepare for eventual start of the new school year based on school and district guidance. I would like to thank you all for valuable service you provide and wish each of you safe and healthy year ahead as you perform your duties as crossing guards. So just really quickly, today's agenda can be seen here. Uh, you will note that the training is in five sessions compressed into two hour training with breakout sessions for crossing guard demos, health and welfare, traffic laws regarding crosswalks, and closing comments and questions. There's no scheduled break, so please feel free to get up and straight um, stretch and take care of your own needs uh, wherever you are. So with that, I'll hand it over to Don Cross from the City of Phoenix. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Don, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I am from Illinois, and I was a crossing guard for 16 years, so I'm certified in Illinois. Do I really need to do this? Yes, everybody has to do this every year. Okay. So um, we're going to go into the uh, Guardians of the Future uh, video. So I'll be sharing my screen. Let's see. All right, here we go. Yeah. 
The first step in becoming a crossing guard is to understand your basic equipment. In this chapter, you will learn about the obvious and not so obvious items required to perform your duties as a crossing guard. Basic crossing guard equipment would include your bright yellow vest, your stop paddle, and the portable signs that go out into the roadway at your crossing location. Make sure you always wear your safety vest when working and make sure it is bright and clean. Not only is the vest mandatory, it is the single most important item that allows you to be seen by drivers. Your safety vest is bright orange or fluorescent yellow green. Besides making you more visible to drivers, it establishes your authority over the crosswalks. Always wear your vest over your jacket or raincoat. The next most important item to get the attention of drivers is your stop paddle. Keep the stop paddle clean and in good condition. If it gets faded or damaged, get a replacement from your school or school district. Other vital components of your crossing guard toolkit are the portable signs which are also provided by your school district. We'll discuss the proper placement of these signs in a later chapter. An area often overlooked by crossing guards is health and safety. The hot sun, dehydration, and high volume traffic areas are just some of the issues that Arizona crossing guards face. There are materials you can use to protect yourself. Let's begin with protection from the sun. Wearing a bright orange or yellow green hat will protect your head and face from the sun and keep you more visible. Keeping water with you at your crossing location will help prevent dehydration. In case of emergency, it is important to have a two-way radio or cell phone with you. This will allow you to contact the school office, 911, or report suspicious activities if needed. If you do have a cell phone, remember that it may only be used in an emergency. The health and welfare of the children and families you cross every day is another important part of your job as a crossing guard. You are often the front line for the school when a child is sick or hurt at the crosswalk. You are also able to observe if any of your children or their family members are having hydration issues. So, uh, in chapter one, it talks Entonces, about your basic equipment. Uh, you always have to have your, your vest tener el and chaleco. your stop paddle. Uh, and a hat is also helpful uh, in our heat, of course, um, when you're going to work in the roadway. For communication, it's always important to have your phone or a uh, radio for the office. Uh, you should stay hydrated with something to drink. Um, sunscreen is very important because um, you know you never know uh, when you're going to uh, feel the effects of the heat. So keep those things in mind when you're ready to uh, do your job as a crossing guard. Now we're going to go into chapter two that will discuss uh, 15 mile an hour yellow crosswalks. The Yellow Crosswalk is your domain. It's up to you to make sure the children use it safely. In this chapter, you will learn how to set up and operate the Yellow Crosswalk. Yellow Crosswalks have a 15 mile per hour speed limit as mandated by state law. That speed limit is only in effect when the portable signs are in the roadway. The lower speed limit begins at the first 15 mile per hour sign on approach to the crosswalk. It ends once the motorists pass the crosswalk, where they are permitted to resume driving at the normal posted speed. Passing another vehicle in a 15 mile per hour school zone is strictly prohibited by law. Permanent school Pentagon signs are installed by the local agency in advance of all school crosswalks to warn motorists of upcoming school crossings. It is your job to place the portable signs in the street at your 15 mile per hour school crossing. You need to get these signs in the street in the proper sequence, usually 45 minutes before school starts. To help you, there may be yellow dots painted on the street to show you exactly where to place your signs. The first sign to be installed is the no passing 15 mile per hour school in session sign. Place it on the yellow dot that is located in advance of the crosswalk. Next, you will place another no passing 15 mile per hour school in session sign in advance of the crosswalk for the opposite directions of traffic. 
On some busier streets, you may have more than one 15-mile-per-hour portable sign to position on approaches to the crosswalk. It is important to let drivers know they are approaching a 15-mile-per-hour school crossing before they near the yellow crosswalk. So all of the portable 15-mile-per-hour signs must be placed where they belong before you position the Stop for Children in Crosswalk signs. These signs get placed on the center line of the street right at the crosswalk so they can be seen easily by motorists coming from both directions. For wider, busier streets, you may have more than one of these signs for each approach. It is very important that all of your signs are in place and clearly visible to oncoming traffic. If you have questions about sign placement or if you need a new sign, please contact the school principal. Once the students have finished crossing, the signs need to be removed no later than 30 minutes after the final class has been dismissed. You do this in precisely the reverse order from which you put the signs out. First, remove the Stop When Children in Crosswalk sign, then remove one of the 15 mile per hour school in session signs, then the other until all the signs have been removed from the street. Be sure to store your signs in a secure and safe place off the street or in the schoolyard. Signs shall not block the sidewalk and turn them away from the street so that drivers are not confused by seeing them when the 15 mile per hour speed limit is not in effect. If a school crossing is located directly adjacent to the school, the portable signs may be allowed to stay up for the entire school day. A signed agreement must exist between the school district and the local authority to allow for this. But if the crosswalk is not adjacent to a school, the signs must be removed before you leave your area or go off duty. Sometimes this means the signs have to be placed and removed several times a day. Doing so encourages motorists to be more willing to comply with the 15 mile per hour speed limits when needed. If this is a situation at your school crossing, make sure you place and remove the portable signs in the correct sequence each time you do it. Before we move on, there is one critical point we need to make. The signs do not automatically protect you from motorists. This is why it is required to wear your bright reflective vest. Your vest and hat make you more visible to drivers. Wait for appropriate gaps in traffic before you attempt to place your signs. If necessary, get someone from the school, such as a maintenance worker, to help you by observing traffic and advising you of potentially dangerous situations. Ask your school's principal to assign help if you need assistance. Once your signs are in place, your next major responsibility is to work with the children. You need to establish your authority as the person running the crosswalk right at the beginning of the school year. Of course you want the children to like you, but it is more important that they respect you, take direction from you, and learn from you. Make sure they don't arrive at school too early. Confirm with your school the appropriate time for their arrival. Work with your principal to define safe places for the children to wait if they arrive early. It is important that you cross the children in groups, not individually. Make sure there is a safe gap in traffic before you step out into the street. Make eye contact with the drivers to make sure that they see you. Once you are sure all oncoming drivers see you from both directions, walk to the middle of the crosswalk with your stop paddle held high. Instruct the children to look left, right, and left again before entering the street. Tell the children to walk quickly across the street. Don't let them play, run or ride bikes or scooters, or use wheel shoes in the crosswalk and keep your eye on traffic the entire time you occupy the crosswalk. Keep your paddle high even after the children are safe on the other side of the street until you step up on the curb and are out of harm's way. Teach the children the proper way to cross the street by doing it the right way yourself. Stop before entering the street, look left, then right, then left again, waiting for a safe gap in traffic. Making eye contact with the drivers is a key ingredient to safety. Make sure that drivers are paying attention to you and really see you. Remember, your responsibility is to see to it that the children arrive safely at school. If you feel that you need additional help to get the job done properly, speak to your school principal and get some help. So let's review. Always arrive at your crosswalk about an hour before school starts. Begin placing your portable signs 45 minutes before school starts. Put out the no passing 15 mile per hour school zone signs first on the yellow dots in advance of the crosswalk. 
first on approach to the crosswalk and then the other. Place the stop for children in crosswalk signs last on the center line right at the crosswalk. Group the children away from the curb or roadway and wait for a safe gap before stepping into the crosswalk. Make sure you make eye contact with the drivers and don't just look at the cars. Make sure the driver really sees you. No matter who you are or what you're doing, there will always be motorists who will not stop for you. Make sure the children walk across the street quickly and without fooling around. Running, playing, riding bicycles, scooters, or wheeled shoes are not permitted. Maintain your position in the center of the crosswalk and signal the children to cross. Keep your stop paddle high above your head even after the children are across the street until you have returned to the curb. Now you are protecting yourself. Don't ever let a student do your job for you. And this is very important. Don't direct traffic. The motorist will automatically move forward when you are out of the street. Your stop paddle is lowered and it is safe for them to proceed. You are not a member of the police force. Only a trained and sworn police officer can direct traffic. It is not your job to stop speeders or drivers that are passing other cars. Your job is to protect the safety of the children and yourself, period. You can report any traffic concerns to the city's street transportation department through your principal. So in chapter two, we saw how to set up and operate a 15 mile an hour school zone crosswalk. Uh, like the video said, it's important that you do the 15 mile an hour signs in the roadway first, because you want traffic to slow down on the approach to the crosswalk. That's why you do the 15 mile an hours first, then you put the stop when children out when you're doing your uh, arrival setup. For your afternoon teardown, again, you need to leave the 15 mile an hour signs out in the road because you want traffic to stay slow. So you take out the stop when children first, then you remove the 15 mile an hour portables after that. So the traffic is at the slowest um, pace that it could be at. Now we're going to move on to chapter three, and that talks about white crosswalks. Another type of crosswalk you will encounter as a crossing guard is a white crosswalk. In this chapter, you will learn how to operate white crosswalks at four-way stop locations, two-way stop locations, and other variations of the two. Under state law, white crosswalks have different rules and regulations than yellow crosswalks. Schools are not required to provide a crossing guard at these locations. The decision to place a trained crossing guard at a white crossing would be up to the school. The location and length of time for the crossing guard to be at these locations would be determined by individual schools and their hours of operation. Your role in a white crosswalk is to provide assistance to school children crossing the location during school operation hours. This does not change the importance and vital role the crossing guard plays at these locations. The basics are still the same. A reflective vest, a stop paddle, a bright yellow or orange hat, water, cell phone or radio, and sunscreen to keep yourself visible and hydrated at your crossing location. Where you will notice the biggest change is in the setup of the crosswalk. White crosswalks are not allowed by state law to operate in combination with 15 mile per hour or stop when children in crosswalk portable signs. Not having to handle the portable signs allows the crossing guard at a white crosswalk to concentrate on the most important part of the job, crossing children safely. Let's discuss the types of intersections that have white crosswalks. One such location is a four-way stop intersection. These areas have white crosswalks on all four sides of the intersection to match the stop signs. These locations can be operated with either one or two crossing guards. We will discuss both options. 
If you are one crossing guard operating the four-way stop, it is very important to choose the right side to stand on to greet the children. This is especially important in the morning at arrival. You will need to stand across from the school where the most children cross. At the beginning of the school year, you may not be sure exactly where that is. It will only take a day or two to find out. How many children cross and when they cross can change over the school year as well. Stay in contact with your school principal for any changes to the crossing patterns. As one crossing guard at a four-way stop, you can cross up to three sides of the street to get children to school. It is vital that you are in control of the crosswalk and that you understand how to facilitate crossing at each corner. If you need to cross three corners, you will start with the corner you are on, then follow a U pattern until you are on the other corner of the school. If you have two corners to cross, you will cross the students in an L pattern. You will hold the kids at your starting corner while you cross the children from the opposite corner to you. Once you and the children have come out of the street and returned to your starting corner, you will then cross the group in the closest crosswalk to the school to complete the pattern. The crossing patterns are much easier with a second crossing guard. Heavy pedestrian and vehicle traffic at four-way intersections often require the schools to consider hiring a second crossing guard. They can be extremely helpful to maintain a safe crossing area in this situation. In a two crossing guard situation, each guard will be responsible for two corners. Communication between the two guards is crucial to the success of the crossing and safety of the children. A more common type of crosswalk location is a two-way stop intersection. White crosswalks can be painted on two or three sides of the intersection or placed next to a yellow crosswalk. The challenge of operating the white crosswalk at a two-way stop location is looking out for the direction of traffic without stop control. If you have two corners to cross, you will cross the students in an L pattern. You will hold the kids at your starting corner while you cross the children from the opposite corner to you. Once you and the children have come out of the street and returned to your starting corner, you will then cross a group in the closest crosswalk to the school to complete the pattern. Some white crosswalks at two-way stop locations have a yellow crosswalk next to them. This is a different type of crossing challenge. You will be required to set up the portable signs for the yellow crosswalk and operate the crosswalk along with the white crosswalks. The yellow crosswalks will be on the side without a stop sign. To cross students, you will need to use the L pattern or the U pattern. So let's review. Always remember to wear your bright reflective vest and bright hat. Have a clean stop paddle, water, sunscreen, and a two-way radio or cell phone. Find the corner where the majority of your children need to cross, especially for morning arrival. When operating a white crosswalk at a two-way or a four-way stop location, remember to use the L or U crossing pattern, depending on the amount of crosswalks at the intersection. Whether you are crossing children in a white or yellow crosswalk, you serve a vital role in the lives of the children you cross. They look to you to protect their safety and ensure that they arrive at school in good health and ready to learn. So that was uh, chapter three, uh, where we talked about uh, working in white crosswalks. Uh, one thing we want to mention too, uh, to help with the video, with the streaming quality of it, uh, we're asking everybody to turn off their, their videos. Um, so that way uh, we're, we're putting more of the streaming into the video and not the, uh, the videos of everybody else. Um, in the room so if you could do that that would be great and if you notice your cameras being turned off that's why uh, so in white crosswalks you operate similar than as you were in yellow crosswalks um, your paddle still held high you're still calling the kids out uh, the difference is you're not operating with the portable signs that's the difference all right, so we're going to move on to chapter four, and we're going to look at signalized intersections.
signalized intersections often carry heavier volumes of traffic traveling at higher speeds. This traffic mixed with pedestrians can be challenging. In this chapter, you will learn how to operate white crosswalks at these locations and how best to keep yourself and the children you cross safe. Crosswalks are typically painted on all sides of the intersection. Crossing duties can be performed by either one or two guards, depending on the amount of traffic volume at your location. There are benefits to employing two guards instead of one, which we will discuss later in the chapter. Your basic crossing equipment is even more crucial when you are a crossing guard at a signal. Drivers are often traveling at higher speeds, so the importance of being visible cannot be overstated. Some signalized intersections have push buttons that control the walk-don't-walk walk light and the walk cycle for the intersection. If your signal has a button, you will be able to push it to activate the walk cycle at the intersection. Once you have a group of children ready to cross and you have pushed the button and you receive the walk signal, you should look to make sure the crosswalk is clear. Then raise your stop paddle high so drivers can see it as you enter the street. Quickly motion to the children to enter the crosswalk while monitoring the amount of available walk time. If the time has run out on the walk cycle, hold the children at the corner until the next crossing cycle. Never allow children to cross against the signal and don't ever try to extend the crossing time by staying longer in the street with your stop paddle. Extending the crossing time creates motorist disrespect for the operation of the crosswalk. Traffic signals are typically programmed to work in sequence with nearby signals. All you have to do is push the walk button once before you cross. Even though the light may not change immediately, it will within a minute or so and the walk signal will appear. Rushing or trying to anticipate the signal can do more harm than good. Understanding how to operate the crosswalk while using the pedestrian push button as a guide will help keep you and the children safe. There are three different phases that you should be aware of that will help you be a more effective crossing guard at traffic signals. The first is the walk phase. This phase is self-explanatory, it means what it says. It is important to keep your eye on motorists who may run the red light or who might be turning right or left from a side street. This is why you need to make eye contact with the drivers and not just watch the cars. The second phase is when the light turns to don't walk and is flashing. Some jurisdictions have a countdown instead of a flashing hand. The flashing hand or countdown is a warning not to start crossing the street if you haven't already. If you are in the street when the don't walk signal begins, you still have ample time to cross. The third phase is the solid don't walk. The solid don't walk signal means don't cross. Stay out of the street on the sidewalk as far away from the curb as possible until the next walk signal appears. Motorists are not allowed to enter the crosswalk making right or left hand turns in the portion occupied by the crossing guard. Using a second crossing guard offers more control of the crossing area. Two guards would position themselves in the same crosswalk at the same time, discouraging traffic from entering the crossing from any direction. So let's review. Staying visible with the basic equipment is the key to your safety and the children you cross. Using the pedestrian push button effectively will assist with creating the necessary gaps in traffic to cross the children. Remember the three walk-don't-walk walk phases. Walk on the walk signal, finish crossing, and don't start a new crossing when the don't walk is flashing. And don't cross at all when the don't walk signal is solid and the light is red. So that was chapter four about signalized intersections. Um, working at a signal, you're on a roadway with a lot more traffic, traveling at higher speeds. So it's crucial that you follow all the rules, that you look left, right, left, that you make sure it's clear before you go into the street. You also have to understand how much time you have at your intersection at the crossing once you hit the button, you only have so much time before you have to get out of the road before the light changes. So you have to figure out how much time you need to get the kids out, get them across the street and get back at your corner before it all changes again. So timing is crucial and also being prepared and understanding the rules 
and how to operate will make it a safer condition for you. Now we're gonna go to chapter five that talks about Hawks and other specialized devices. Like anything else in life, crossing devices and locations are always changing and evolving. Local government agencies want to make crossing safer to encourage more walking to school. Technology is helping to improve crossing safety. All across Arizona, there are examples of this technology at work. In this chapter, we are going to discuss how these devices affect you, the crossing guard. The first example we will discuss is the Hawk Signal or High Intensity Activated Crosswalk Beacon. It is a pedestrian activated signal that only is active after the pedestrian pushes the walk button. Hawk signals have white, ladder-style crosswalks and are only installed on high-volume major streets. You will know you are at a Hawk by the unique style signal heads. A crossing guard's first responsibility at one of these locations is to make sure to activate the signal. Once a signal has turned on and traffic has stopped, you would cross children the same way you would at a regular traffic signal. One issue that you have to watch out for are cars that turn into the crosswalk while you are trying to cross the children. The drivers on the opposite side of the hawk will be at a stop sign and may get impatient as they wait to turn. Your position in the crosswalk will be important in discouraging motorists from turning into the crosswalk area. The hawk signal will go through four phases, flashing yellow, solid red, flashing red, and back to black or off. Phase one for the hawk signal is the flashing yellow phase. The flashing yellow lights are to warn drivers to either slow down to a stop or if feasible, continue through the intersection before the hawk signal goes into the second phase, the solid red phase, and pedestrians are allowed to cross. In the solid red phase, drivers in the approach directions of the hawk signal are required to stop. Cross traffic will have stop signs and will be required to stop as well. Pedestrians from the opposite approach will receive a walk sign from the pedestrian head, encouraging them to cross the street. The third phase is the flashing red phase. This phase is the most confusing to drivers. The law allows drivers to proceed through the hawk intersection on a flashing red light if their half of the roadway is clear of pedestrians. Drivers will often err on the side of caution and wait until the signal has gone into its final phase. This indecision by drivers will require crossing guards to pay close attention. The fourth and final phase is when the signal heads are black or off. Drivers in the approach directions to the hawk signal are allowed to proceed, while vehicles and pedestrians in the opposite approach directions are required to stop. Being aware of the phases will enable you to cross children more efficiently. Another type of crossing you may have to work at is a two-stage crosswalk. The crosswalk is painted in a white ladder style and is typically located on major streets in mid-block locations. This type of crossing allows pedestrians to cross one half the width of roadway at a time. The median islands are designed to force walkers to look at the traffic before they try to enter the roadway. Two guards are more effective to cross children at these locations. Each guard would be responsible for one half of the street and one direction of traffic. A few crossing locations are now getting stutter flash devices. These are also pedestrian activated and are designed to get the attention of motorists. When they are activated, the light from the device flashes light at the drivers. They can be installed at either white or yellow crosswalks. They are typically found on major streets with a high volume of traffic. They do not slow down traffic like the 15 mile per hour portable signs, so you need to make sure to make eye contact with drivers as you are getting ready to cross children. No matter what type of crosswalk or traffic control device you have at your location, protecting student safety as they cross the street will be the one part of your job that will never change. Thank you for all you do and for truly being guardians of the future. Okay, so that was chapter five, talking about Hawk devices and other specialty crossing locations. Um, 
we know there isn't a lot of those around the region, but we want to make sure that anybody that has that type of crossing that we've covered that as well. Um, so with a hawk, you got to follow the phases and you have to be more aware of traffic because it isn't always clear if a driver's going to stop or, or proceed. So it's important that you're really watching to make sure that drivers are doing what they should be doing um, so that you and the kids are in a safer situation. Um, yes, I just, we've been um, monitoring the chat and we've answered some questions. Um, just to let you all know, we are monitoring that. Um, if you wanted, I'm, I'm seeing some that um, are losing their sound. You might want to check your settings. Um, it may be something on your end as I, I heard the entire thing. So, um, so yeah, so you're going to be um, positioned into your breakout room. Somebody's going to be doing that for you. So don't worry about anything. Um, and your presenter will be there shortly. So see you all in the breakout rooms. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, glad you uh, made it into this breakout session. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, the demos uh, of the uh, different crossing patterns that you'll see in the road. Um, I'm, I'm Don Cross. I'm from the uh, City of Phoenix Street Transportation Department. I also, uh, my partner in crime is Brandon Forey. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Brandon. The City of Peoria. And I've got Dory Ludwig with the uh, City of Glendale. Say hi, hi, Dory. Good morning. Hello. And we also have Justin with us, right? Yes, I'm here. All right, so we're going to go through, I think it's nine scenarios and there'll be a few poll questions that we're gonna have you guys answer in the chat. So we're gonna get started. You can see my screen okay, Don? Yeah. Brandon. Okay. Here we go. So here we're at a four-way stop. We have one crossing guard and they're going to be doing a single leg crossing. So Dory, go ahead and start the video. You see that the guard has their paddle held high all the way till they get to the middle. They call out the students so the kids don't try to cross before she calls them. She stays positioned, keeping her paddle high and keeps her paddle up all the way till she reaches her starting corner. So you may have noticed that she was on the opposite side of the kids. Um, the fact that she was at a four-way stop, she chose that location because it made sense as far as crossing all of the legs. Brandon, did you have anything else to say about that? Uh, no, the, the just actually it leads right into our next scenario. So there's kind of a, a the broader context you'll see in just one moment. Perfect. So in this next scenario, it's really the same guard at the same location, but we're showing two uh, crossing two legs in what we call the L pattern. So in, in the example you just saw, uh, the guard was returning to her corner because she had kids from multiple sides. So in this case, you see them on the opposite corner. So she's gonna cross one group of kids. In this case, again, see, notice how the kids are waiting. They're not walking out until she tells them it's time to cross. And I apologize, this is a little bit choppy here, but hopefully you can get the, get the gist of it. Then she returns to the corner. She went to the other side because there was a group of kids on the far side of the intersection that she needed to cross. So crossing in that L pattern, she made the one crossing with the students uh, comes out to uh, the other crossing to the halfway point, calls them across, and will return with those students back to her corner. Uh, in this case, she has some really difficult crossings to do. She's only crossing on two legs, but there are kids coming from all corners. So she's probably going to return to the original corner that we had seen her at at the beginning of the scenario. 
This is where we really leave it up to you as to where it's most appropriate for you to be based on where the greatest number of students are coming from and where all the students, all the quarters where they're arriving, uh, because the closer you are to those students, the more control you have over them. So this is a bit of a judgment call. It's not a one size fits all answer for where you should stand on which corner you should stand. And it can change based on the morning and the afternoon. The afternoon, you're almost always going to be on the school side, whereas in the morning, it's very warm. Did you have anything else to add, Don? No, uh, that was good. Um, let's move on to the next one. All right, so we're at the same intersection. We're gonna be doing the same L pattern, but this time it'll be with two guards. So you'll see the first guard go out by herself. Uh, Dory, go ahead and start it. So the first guard goes out. You can't even see the second guard. He's at that opposite corner. So again, she positions herself, calls the kids out. She keeps her paddle held high. The other kids that walk up to the corner are waiting till she gets back. So she keeps it up till she gets to the corner. And now she's going to join the second guard in this first crosswalk to complete the L. So you notice that they're on their half of their uh, side of the crosswalk. They call the kids out. So they both stay in position, keeping their paddles high. The kids continue all the way to the corner. And then they go back to their starting corners. So the only thing that uh, maybe we would call out in this one is the position that the first guard was in. Uh, she went to the outside of the crosswalk. Uh, we always suggest that you go to the inside of the crosswalk. Um, so you are the closest to traffic and you're a barrier between traffic and the kids. So she could have been on that opposite side of the intersection. What do you think, Brandon? Yeah, and, and just for a little extra clarification, really that applies to when you've got two crossing guards. Because when you have two crossing yeah. guards, instead of having to walk halfway out of the street, you really only have to walk about a quarter to a third of the way because you're only worried about one direction of travel. And that's when you would stand on the crosswalk line closest to approaching traffic. But when there's just one crossing guard, you're watching all directions. So there's no one proper side necessarily. So we right. just say wherever you're most visible is where you want. And the benefits of having the second guard is it stops the turning traffic. Um, so you'll find that whether it's a four-way stop or at a signal, same idea. But as a, a second guard, you can also affect the way traffic flows through an intersection. So the second guard is key and crucial depending on how you use them. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, in this next scenario, this is going to be similar to what we've seen already. It's one guard with an L crossing, but it's a two-way stop as opposed to a four-way uh, four stop. In this case, we've got two directions are stop controlled with white crosswalks, and we have a yellow 15 mile an hour school crossing on, on one of the legs. So Dory, go ahead and play it through and I'll just talk. Of course, there's always the obvious, you wanna look left, right and left before you walk in the street, you want the kids to wait for you. Uh, but what's a little bit different with uh, a 15 mile school crossing is, since you don't have a stop sign, cars may be just driving through and driving through. So what you wanna do is make sure you're identifying a proper gap in traffic before you're crossing out into the street. Um, Sometimes we have concerns from crossing guards that will walk out into the street. Cars will be driving through as they're walking out. But um, if you don't give them enough time, if you step out into the street when a car is driving and they're almost, they're just about to enter the crosswalk, of course they're gonna drive through. So you wanna, don't force cars to make that tough decision and slam on their brakes. Uh, so that's the point to really drive home. Some of the best ways you can do that is if you make eye contact with the drivers, or better yet, start to raise your stop paddle before you set foot into the street to give a clear sign to the drivers that you are intending to walk out into the street. That's the best communication you can give to those drivers so it's very clear what your intentions are. Uh, this so, is where we have our first poll question. Oh yeah. 
Craig. Perfect. So our first question is number one, what if anything could be improved at this point? And you can go ahead and vote. And is this specifically from the, the scenario we just saw, just for clarification, Dory? I believe it is from the one we just saw, yes. Okay, is there any, uh, I know some people are answering, is there any way you can show it again? Because that might've taken them by surprise. The last uh, video? Yes. Okay. And if some people have voted so far. We have about 10% that have voted. Do we wanna go ahead and end the polling and show it or wait? Uh, I don't know, what do you think? This is our first time doing this, so I, I realize that, that you guys didn't, you weren't prepared for the question. Let so, them vote. Uh, you might not have seen what happened. Let's let them vote and then we can talk about it. Okay. We have about 20% okay. voted. And we're almost at about 40, a little over 40% voting. This is almost like one of those memory tests when someone comes in and then afterwards they say, what color shirt were they wearing? How good a witness are you? <laughs> right. So we'll give it a few more seconds. We're just at 50% and then we'll go ahead and end the poll. We'll go ahead and end it here. We do have two more poll questions coming up in the video, just so everyone is aware, so. And the results, um, the highest percentage said nothing is wrong, but the correct answer is best was not zipped. Do you guys wanna share anything on that, Brandon or Don? I, I wanna see if maybe you could just play it through very quickly so that yeah. we can show. We won't necessarily have to see the whole thing either. You should be, we should be able to see if her vest was not. See if we can see it from here. Go ahead and start. I know the quality is not very good. Sorry about that. Oh, you can see it flapping in the wind a little bit. Yeah, because the angle she started at, it was hard to tell whether it was zipped or not. But right there you can. This is a master's level question here. <laughs> Just because between the graininess of the video and the angle, it's hard to yeah. tell. All right, so All right, we'll go back so to the next um, demo. Give me one second. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we're still at the two-way stop. It's gonna be one crossing guard doing a U pattern which is three sides of the intersection. So Dory, go ahead and start. So the guard goes out, gets position, calls the kids out, keeps her paddle up. So this is the first leg of the U. Now they reach the corner. She's decided to let this car make the turn, which is very important. You don't want traffic to back up any more than they have to. Now she's going out and positioning her, herself again in the middle, calling the kids out. And again, keeping her stop paddle high so everybody can see the paddle. I like the kid jumping on the different uh, uh, marks in the crosswalk. So that was the second part of the U. Again, she let the, the car turn. Now she's going to complete the third leg of the U and cross this last group. Every time she kept her paddle high, she kept a barrier between herself and the traffic and kept it high all the way until she gets back to the, the corner. Brandon, did you, did you have anything to say about that? Yeah, there was a question that uh, someone asked if uh, we're supposed to be looking for things wrong. And really, it's just 
watch these. These are somewhat real world examples with real traffic and real people. So um, it, it's, it's better than um, trying to simulate it like we used to, in my opinion, better than we tried to simulate it uh, with tape on the floor because you can see the real moving parts. So just try to apply what we've said so far. And if you notice anything, for one example, on this last, on this last scenario, the crossing guard really seemed like she was uh, facing this direction uh, on the leg, but there's a car stopped right at the yellow crosswalk um, that maybe she could have at least focused a little bit of attention to make sure they're not moving and they're not going to turn on her or anything like that. And it's not to say we're trying to criticize because we, Don and I know uh, we both served as the crossing guard and many, many times in the videos and we think we did it right. And then someone says, no, you forgot to do this or you got to do that. There's really <laughs> so much to keep track of. There really is that that's why we go over it and, and repeat because it's not as simple as just raising a stop paddle and walking into the street. If you and that's why we it. do these exactly that's why we do these trainings every year too because there's always little things that maybe you forget or little things that maybe you thought you knew but then you learn a new way and you're better yeah our hope is that you can even if you've been doing this for 25 years that you might pick up some little nugget or some little piece of advice that that might be helpful to you in your situation so the next scenario is a uh, two-way stop, two guards with the L crossing. And the biggest part I want to make about point I want to make about this one is that the guards work together on the crosswalk they share. They operate independently on the crosswalk they don't share. So Dory, go ahead and play this scenario. Now our guards are standing on the side they are because they're they're standing on the corner of the crosswalk they share. That's why she's not necessarily close to her students but she is still making sure the traffic is stopped. In this case, we do have a car there that's stopping and she's crossing the kids. She's going to return to her corner uh, once the kids have crossed. And I'm pretty sure she's gonna show us a really good um, practice right here in just one moment. Notice she doesn't have her vest zipped. Uh, <laughs> she's gonna lower her paddle when she's on the corner and that car that was waiting, she, there, she let the car go. She didn't wave it through, but she let the car go, uh, both a through car and the turning car, before she coordinated with her partner to step, to step out into the crosswalk. Notice they're standing on the line closest to approaching traffic. The kids are waiting for their signal. They're only going out to their half of the crosswalk and they're working together. This is a really good example of working together. And once those students are completely out of the crosswalk for the yellow crosswalk, both guards will return to their corners. And she lowered her paddle a little bit early, but overall, I think this was a really good example. Mm -hmm. Did you notice anything on this scenario, Don, that I hadn't mentioned? No, uh, I think you're right on the money. Um, why don't we move on to the next one? So again, we're at the two-way stop and we have two guards, but they're doing the U pattern this time. So that's the three legs. So again, uh, they work independently on the sides of the U, but work together at the bottom of the U. So the guard again went out to the middle, kept her paddle high, called the kids out and they crossed. So they're getting ready to do their cross together. They had to let that car turn. Now there was a student that went out too early. So this happens from time to time where kids decide they, they don't want to wait. So it's up to you as the guard to stop that and to remind them that you're there to protect them and that you'll call them out when it's time to cross. Now you see an errant uh, jogger go through the intersection. Those are the kind of things that you can't control. Uh, you hope the guard, uh, the uh, jogger is watching uh, so he stays safe, but all you can control is yourself and the kids. So the second guard went and did the third part of the U and they all made it back safely. So they worked really well together as a group. Uh, 
So uh, again, it's important that you remind the kids that they need to wait until you call them out. Brandon, do you have anything else? This scenario had so much going on. Yeah, exactly. Um, a couple, couple of things I wanted to throw out. One, uh, I can't remember if it was my scenario or this, I think it was the beginning of this scenario. The guard actually starts stepping out when the, cro when the, the car is still driving through the crosswalk. Mm. So I would caution to make it very clear, don't set foot out into the crosswalk until the crosswalk is clear. And hopefully um, the vehicles have time to stop or even better yet, there's a complete gap in traffic. Uh, the jogger. So we get that question is are our crossing guards responsible for crossing adults or people that aren't their school children. And uh, I'll ask you to think about that for a second and we don't have the interaction that we do normally, but uh, there have been court cases and precedents where the answer is yes, but um, to, re to a reasonable degree. Uh, if, if they, if you ask them to wait for you and they choose not to, Okay, so be it. In that case, the guard didn't even have a chance to ask the, jo the jo jogger to, uh, to stop. He just went through. That's okay. Um, and then the last thing is you notice that, I don't know if you recall, that, that car that was stopped at the yellow crosswalk when our guard was crossing on that white crosswalk for the last crossing made the turn through the intersection. And that's okay because none of the movements were blocked uh, that were affecting that crosswalk, that were affecting that car making its turn. So that was perfectly acceptable. So this last scenario, uh, these last two scenarios are at a traffic signal. Um, this is one crossing guard. We realize it's challenging for one crossing guard uh, at a traffic signal if you do what we're asking you to do. So uh, I'm gonna just play it through and I'll, I'll narrate as it's going. Our crossing guard is setting foot. It says walk, our guard is out making sure all traffic is stopped first. And uh, because, you know, Arizona is unfortunately one of the top uh, states in the country for run red crashes. So you can't be sure just because the light is red and because you've got a walk signal, that it's gonna be safe for those kids to cross. So in this scenario, he waited as we would ask him to, to call the kids across. They're walking, he's walking back before they're fully out of the street. And part of the reason for that has to do with the difference between white and yellow crosswalks, which will be covered in the police section a bit more. But once the kids have crossed your half of the crosswalk, you can start to walk back, especially if you're running out of time. But in this scenario, our guard ran out of time. Dory, can you go back to the beginning, just play it through quickly one more time, and I'll point out a couple of of specifics and, and Don and I and Dory and I, we all understand this challenge because we've served as crossing guards for videos and for trainings. Um, just okay. gonna put up for a second, Steve. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, we had to be placed in the correct room with you all. Welcome to the traffic laws regarding crosswalks breakout session. I have Steve Petrie here from the city of Phoenix police department and he's gonna provide you this presentation. Um, I, I should mention as well, if you have questions during the presentation, please put those in the chat. I will be monitoring that and we will address those at the end of the session. So with that, go ahead, Steve. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Officer Petrie. I'm a motor officer for the city of Phoenix. Uh, I've been an officer here for city of Phoenix for 27 years. Of those 27 years, I've been on the um, uh, traffic bureau for 22 years. Uh, Today, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about, I guess, about the school crosswalks and crosswalk themselves. Uh, so here for the state of Arizona, um, we do have unmarked and marked white crosswalks. Um, pedestrians must yield to vehicles before entering the roadway. Motorists must yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk only in their half of the roadway. So once the pedestrians are off uh, their half, uh, those vehicles uh, can resume uh, going through that crosswalk. So again, as long as that pedestrian is not on their half of the uh, roadway anymore. Uh, if a motorist may, may not pass a vehicle that is stopped for a uh, pedestrian or crosswalk. So, uh, yeah, one vehicle stopped for that pedestrian. Nobody is allowed to pass that vehicle. Uh, next slide, please. So 
also um, school crossing uh, crossings. Uh, so they are a little bit different than uh, a regular crosswalk. Just the regular crosswalks are white. Uh, the school crossings, they're going to be marked yellow. So yellow crosswalks with portable signs that read no passing, 15 miles an hour, fines double, and school in session. And then you have the stop when children in, in the crosswalk. Uh, motorist must stop for all pedestrians, not just children in any part of the yellow crosswalk. And the 15 mile an hour limit applies when the portable signs are in the street. Um, so this only applies when the signs are out in the roadway. If, uh, the no passing um, school zone stop, 15 mile an hour sign is not in the roadway or the stop when children in crosswalk. If not, and none of these signs are in the roadway, it's just going to be treated as a regular crosswalk. Once, the, once these signs are out in the roadway, then it's uh, designated as a school zone uh, with the yellow crosswalk. Next slide, please. Um, so every school, uh, you guys are going to have an operating agreement um, with your city. Uh, this is going to allow uh, your school to put these portable signs out into the roadway. Uh, it's going to give the times for portable signs uh, out in the street. Uh, so some of, you'll see notice that some of these um, schools uh, will have all day school zones. So they're out in the morning and they're all the way out all the way until they're picked up uh, when school is out. Uh, some of these um, school zones are out in the morning. You got to pick them up. And school starts and then you got to put them back out uh, in the roadway once school is getting ready to get dismissed. So that's going to be totally up to the operating agreement that you have the school has with the city. And then of course it's going to state if a crossing guard is required or not at that particular um, uh, next slide please. Uh, so the school zones are designated 15 miles an hour. Uh, 15 mile speed limit sign is only in effect from the first no passing 15 mile an hour portable sign to the marked yellow crosswalk. So once they get to that first sign that says school zone 15 miles an hour, they have to be at 15 as soon as they cross that sign. Not that they have to slow down to 15 by the time they get to the crosswalk. Uh, they have to be at 15 as soon as they pass that 15 mile an hour sign. Uh, and then just uh, real quick, when you guys are putting these signs out, um, make sure uh, that you put them out where they're designated to be. Uh, they talked earlier about usually they're marked. So please put them out um, where they're supposed to be specifically. Uh, please don't um, shorten the crosswalks or, or the school zones or make them longer. So they have the agreement where these signs are going to go. So please put the signs out uh, where they need to be. If you have one that's damaged or missing, get with your school so you can get them replaced. Um, if we come out there and try to do some enforcement and it's uh, signs are missing or not properly posted, uh, we're, we won't be able to do any kind of enforcement out there because uh, it does have to be proper. Um, next uh, slide, please. Uh, passing in a school zone. So uh, that's otherwise directed by a uh, traffic or police officer and subject to exemptions granted the driver of an authorized emergency vehicle in this chapter, uh, the driver of vehicle shall obey the instructions of an official traffic control device applicable to the driver that is placed in accordance with this chapter. Um, so what this basically is just saying that there's not gonna be any kind of passing in a school zone. Uh, for some reason, the only way that they can go through the school zone is if they're actually directed by a police. Um, 
passing in the school zone uh, overtakes the front bumper of another vehicle. Um, a lot of the school zones are just one lane. You really don't have to worry about it. It's just one lane. Uh, the problem with uh, no passing is when you have multiple lanes um, that when passing can occur. So if it is designated a school zone and the signs are out in the roadway, uh, that first vehicle is going to kind of set the pace. So if he's doing 15 miles an hour, nobody can pass him. Uh, even if he's going 10 miles an hour, uh, if he's that lead vehicle, then just because he's going 10 miles an hour doesn't mean you can pass him. Uh, they cannot pass, pass any vehicle in that school place. Next slide, please. Uh, the fines double. Uh, the fines double in um, each jurisdiction. Uh, they can be almost up to $1,000. Uh, the no passing 15 mile hour portable signs, they must say fines double uh, for them to get the double. Uh, but usually what it's here in the city of Phoenix, if we don't write the double fine, even it's still kind of pricey here, at least in the city of Phoenix, it's usually right around $260 um, for speeding in the school. Now, if they do the double one, it's going to be close to like you said, about $560 uh, if that particular uh, Next one, please. Steve, I just wanted to let you know you are breaking up just a little bit. So I don't know. Oh, if you... okay. There you go. Go ahead. Oh, it's you a little, a little better now. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, crossing guards uh, are not police officers, uh, so please don't um, direct traffic. Um, enforce the law. Wave vehicles through the crosswalk. Uh, stop vehicles to allow other. Uh, cars or buses to make turns, uh, stand in the roadway, or force vehicles to stop abruptly. Um, we kind of kind of know that you're trying to help traffic uh, out, maybe because it's so congested. But please uh, don't do this. Um, you guys, your main concern is the kids and anybody crossing in that crosswalk. Um, now you guys are trying to maybe empty out the parking lot or be courteous to the school buses uh, that are trying to leave or come into the parking lot, but please don't do that. Uh, again, your concern is just getting these kids uh, across the street. Um, please be courteous uh, when you are uh, crossing the kids. Um, don't just automatically jump out into uh, the crosswalk with your stop sign uh, expecting a vehicle to stop, um, try to give them a little bit of leeway, um, courtesy uh, before you jump out on that crosswalk, just to give them proper time to stop. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, violations of law, crossing guards must focus again on crossing the students and keeping them safe. Uh, this is more important than getting the license plate. Um, give a, a license plate. Um, there's nothing we can do it as far as the officers are concerned. Um, we have to actually see the violation uh, to write a site. Um, so if you have a problematic vehicle that you see that's always speeding or passing or whatever in the school zone, uh, let your uh, school know or principal, maybe your SRO, and maybe we'll try to get out there and do some enforcement, uh, at least for the city of Phoenix. Um, we kind of have uh, limited numbers of motors right now, kind of staffing like with everybody else. So we try to get to as many schools as we can. Uh, unfortunately, you might see us at your school for one or two days. Uh, then we're gonna have to go to the next school. We have hundreds of schools here, at least in the city of Phoenix. So we try to get to as many as we can. So um, again, if you do have a, a problematic vehicle, uh, just get with your principal and maybe they can contact the traffic bureau for your designated city and try to get some enforcement out there. Uh, my thing is, at least here for the city of Phoenix, um, if you have an SRO at your school, try to get them out there and just having them sit out there 
kind of grab some people's attention. So uh, just kind of be patient with us. We try to get to as many schools as we can. Next one, please. So uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, we'll take some of the questions right now. We're still on the, oh, I, I guess we really covered already submit requests to the school. Um, it's helpful if you're brief and only provide um, specific information, the when, where, and what on the violation. So yeah, we can, we can take some questions now. Um, I, I am seeing some in the box, some are site specific. Um, so the first one that came across, uh, I do a, a crossing, I, I'm a crossing guard at a four way stop with a white line paint and have a hard time crossing kids because parents block my crosswalk. I did notify the principal, so they sent the email to the parents, but uh, it seems the parents don't understand. Um, that's just gonna be kind of uh, trying to get them stopped before they get up to that crosswalk, I guess, if you guys can get out there um, prior to a vehicle coming that close to the crosswalk to stop them. Uh, again, just try to be courteous with them. Don't get into a shouting match with the parents uh again you did the right thing let your um, principal know uh maybe he can contact the law enforcement agency whichever is in your area and maybe they can get some enforcement out there kind of keep an eye on it if they can here's another one um my crossing is adjacent to the school so this would be an abutting um, my zone is out all day um, what can i do to help those who don't adhere to the signs and i think this kind of goes back to the um, crossing guards um, not directing traffic or, or, but I'll let you. Correct. Uh, it's just unfortunately that uh, it's going to be an enforcement issue if uh, the parents or cars aren't obeying the traffic so or the speed limit signs. Um, again, it's please don't get into a talking match or a shouting match with the parents. Uh, try to get with your. Um, your SRO if you have one or your principal so they can try to get some enforcement out there. Um, we understand it's kind of aggravating for you guys because you guys see it day in and day out. Um, we try to get to many schools as we can. So I, I understand just kind of be patient with us. So we try to get out there as soon as we can. So this um, is really more of a comment, but I think I don't think it's um, really directed towards enforcement personnel, Steve. But um, okay. it was with regard to signs being damaged, um, cars hitting them often, and it taking a long time to get them fixed or replaced. So if, it, if it's the rollout signs, um, you need to contact your district to to let them know right away. They'll they'll probably want to try to replace those as soon as possible. If they're the fixed signs on the side of the roadway, um, then that's something for the local agency. So um, that's the, the contact that needs to be made for that. Um, this one says, so can cars stop in the crosswalk if we're not actively crossing at the time? Yeah, that's going to be fine if, as long as you're not interfering with pedestrians. Yeah, they're okay to stop there uh, if they're waiting to get in the school or a parking lot or whatnot. Um, it looks like some of our attendees have uh, are concerned with repeat offenders, um, even after outreaches have been done. Um, that's a real challenge. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Steve. Um. Oh, yeah, we understand. We get that through a lot of the schools, the re repeat offenders, parents, same cars, whatnot. Um, it's just unfortunately, it's they, an officer is going to have to see them to um, give them a citation. So it's just hopefully that um, you can get with your law enforcement agency to do some enforcement out there. Because I'll tell you, nothing's more happier than stopping a vehicle and getting with the crossing guard later saying that's the vehicle, that's one of the chronic problems. So 
uh, we'll try to get that out there as soon as we can. So we have two minutes, Steve, just to let you know. Um, one question, how do we go about getting a resource officer? Uh, that's going to have to go through the school. So they're going to have to go through uh, the school and the city to see if they can get an SRO out um, at their school. Uh, some of the schools sometimes get federal grants or city can work out to have a school resource officer assigned to the school. I know some of these uh, school resource officers, they kind of will bounce around uh, if they have, sometimes they might have two schools. So that could be an option too if they're limited on funds or officers. But that, that would have to go through the school. Another one, electric, electric speed monitoring signs, are we responsible for them? Which ones? The electric speed monitoring signs. Um, trying to picture elect, just the speed, the speed sign that's- I'm, I'm wondering if it, this is a speed feedback sign. Uh, I'm, that's what I'm thinking it is. Um, as far as responsible, I mean, I don't, um, they're just letting the drivers know how fast they're going if they're approaching a, a particular school. Uh, I see these actually, they're not for actually in the school zone. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, the cities, if they are coming up to a school, if, it, if there's no school zone that's going to be present, uh, say that it's a 35 mile an hour roadway and you're approaching a school. Uh, if school's in session, they lower the speed limit sign to 30. And sometimes that they'll have those speed signs right there that monitor the vehicle speed. It's just letting the driver know how fast they're going, if that makes sense. Okay, so yeah, they, um, they did respond saying it is the speed feedback signs that they're referring to. Yeah. Um, and I apologize if you put a, a really long um, narrative in with your question it, it may be difficult for us to to read through those we we have less than one minute here um and i did what i uh, real quick margaret i did notice one that what uh, question that kind of popped up that caught my attention if i'm looking at it right uh if you guys are in the crosswalk crossing the kids do you have to stay in that crosswalk the whole time yes if, it, if it's a yellow crosswalk you guys have to stay in that crosswalk with your stop sign out until they're out of the roadway Anything else? Let me see if we have anything else. I, I believe we already answered the question about, um, I had a request to answer somebody's question. I think we covered it earlier with, um, I asked, can cars stop in the crosswalk if we're not actively crossing at the time? Yeah, we talked about, we got that one. Yeah, as long as you're not, um, you're not trying to cross anybody, they're gonna be okay. All right, I uh, just wanted to really quick uh, thank everyone for um, attending this online training for crossing guards. Um, really appreciate your time and your commitment to um, preserving safety and protecting our kids. Um, so I am Chris Gottsacker. I'm a transportation engineer with the Maricopa Association of Governments. Uh, I helped organize uh, this training session. Um, just want a couple housekeeping items. Again, keep your videos off to preserve bandwidth uh, for the presenters. Um, with really large meetings, it can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, but yeah, and then also just remain muted and put any questions that you have in the chat box and I'll uh, get to them um, as I can. Uh, most likely we'll uh, wait to uh, get all the questions answered at, at the very end. Um, but uh, just know that yes i am i am reading chat i may respond to some uh, items in the chat as well but then also bring them up um so with that um without further ado let uh, phoenix fire take it away introduce himself all right thank you chris hey kyle did you want to introduce yourself buddy yeah i'm kyle lane i'm the public education coordinator for peoria fire medical and so i'm here with chris and tammy uh just uh, lending some support so thanks for having me Awesome. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, and I also want to mention that Kyle uh, helped update our PowerPoint here. So thank you, Kyle. 
Um, again, my name is Chris Ozakowski. I'm a firefighter with Phoenix Fire Department, and this is Tammy Morath. She as well is a, a firefighter with the department, and we both work in the community involvement public affairs section. Uh, so what we're going to go over today with you guys is um, taking care of yourselves on being crossing guards. Let me back up one more moment here. I want to thank you guys for taking on the uh, responsibility of being crossing guards and keeping kids safe in, in the valley while they're trying to get to and from school. So thank you for doing that. Um, we're going to go over how to keep you guys safe and healthy um, in this Arizona heat. And I suspect we have some people that may not be from the valley originally. So this is really good information um, for you to keep. Yes. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to uh, put those questions in the chat at any time, and we will address those at the end. And as Chris mentioned earlier, kindly keep your video off. It helps the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, and audio run better. So thank you for doing that. Uh, so we're going to go over heat-related illnesses, signs, the symptoms. There we go. There we go. Uh, treatment and prevention. A lot of times in the valley, you can walk out in the morning and it's nice 70s, 80s, and an hour later, it's easily in the 90s or even the 100s. Um, that temperature can, bite, can spike very quickly, and that will definitely pertain to you guys as crossing guards, more specifically in the afternoons when it's definitely in the 100s. Uh, living in the Sonoran Desert poses a few challenges for us. Um, the big major challenge is the extreme temperatures and our inability to control those temperatures, and that can be lethal. Uh, this is especially true when we are not acclimated to the high temperatures, and not being acclimated can affect anybody. I don't care if you've lived here for your whole life or you just moved here last week. Um, take some time before you guys go out to your post as crossing guards just take short walks, morning, afternoon, evening, get yourself acclimated to this heat. Um, when our body senses that we have an excessive heat temperature internally or cold, um, our brain sends messages to our body on different ways to react to that temperature. So specifically when we're dealing with um, heat, the brain is sending signals to the skin to sweat. Sweat is our, our body's primary job when we're attempting to lower our internal temperature. As the body continues to get warmer, the heart pumps faster, bringing blood closer to the surface of the skin. This causes our capillaries to dilate, which turns the skin pinker. And uh, this is my, my joke for the day. My, my skin turns red like Clifford the dog. And then uh, your sweating process begins. Sweat seeps through your pores and evaporates, taking heat away from the body. And of course, our body can't properly cool us without what? Proper hydration. Water, water, water. Um, if the body does not have the fluid and is missing the minerals necessary to facilitate sweating, we become dehydrated. And that's when we come to, obviously, dehydration. As we get dehydrated, the blood thickens and puts a strain on the heart and the, and the cardiovascular system. I'm sure we've all had that feeling where we feel like we're, your blood just feels honestly like a thick sludge. Your head's pounding, your heart's pounding. That's very good onset. Actually, that's, you're already too late. You're already dehydrated at that point. At that point, we need water and chloride, which is salt and potassium. So after all of that, we're gonna, lead into if we are not prehydrated and we are getting dehydrated while you guys are out there helping the kids getting to school safely we're going to start covering what's going to happen to our bodies next so our heat related illnesses that we're going to come up with is the very first one is you're probably going to end up with getting a sunburn you're going to start getting heat cramps which with your heat cramps those are the mildest form of a heat related illness um, you're going to start out with having muscle spasms because you are low on fluid, fluid and electrolytes. Many of the areas that are going to become affected first will probably be in your legs, your arms, or even getting stomach cramps. Um, and these are stomach cramps that are not associated as far as with the exercise. It's the process of that dehydration. And for some of you, you may not even experience a heat cramps. You may end up going straight into heat exhaustion. 
And that's when your body is in urgent need of getting cooled down. Your internal organs are being affected because your internal body temperature is rising. Um, often this time, you're going to start having heavy sweating. You'll start feeling dizzy or faint. And at this point, if you didn't already have the heat cramps, you're going to start getting the muscle cramping, even though you have not been exercising. Um, you're going to start experiencing headaches, nausea. Once you get past to that point, and now you start noticing that you are no longer sweating, now you're going to go into heat stroke. And this is going to be in a med medical emergency, which requires the 911 system being activated and getting medical treatment from the fire department. Your body temperature will be up over to 104, maybe even higher. You're gonna start having an altered level of consciousness, start getting more disoriented. Your skin will be hot and dry. You will no longer be sweating. Um, difficulty breathing, your heart rate's gonna be racing. And at this point, it is a life-threatening emergency. So treatment with all of these, any heat related illness is you need to stop the activity that you are doing, move to someplace that it is cooler, start getting the clear fluids into your body. Um, that's moving inside. It's not just standing in a cooler place, just meaning being underneath a tree, but get inside where there's AC that you can start cooling your body more using cold compresses on you. Um, start providing a little bit more electrolytes with some Gatorade. Um, it's best if you can dilute it down so it's not just all the sugar that you're intaking. Um, your treatments that you're going to have as far as if you just start with the heat cramps is just rest. If after one hour those heat cramps have not subsided, then you need to look for possibly getting more medical help. Obviously, you're at that point of heat exhaustion. You're going to take a cool shower or a bath. And again, start seeking medical help if you are not feeling any relief from your symptoms. Once you get to the heat stroke, that is definitely a 911 call. They need to do more rapid cooling. They'll do um, start an IV on you with cool fluid, saline fluid. They'll start using ice packs in the armpits and in the groin area, wetting everything down, putting a fan on you to help cool you. So everything we're trying to give you guys is just to prepare prior to when you go out to start your day and then the prevention as far as you actually being out there. And Chris is going to continue on with more prevention. Yes, uh, prevention, number one, water, water, water. I've said that before, haven't I? Well, um, don't just drink any fluid, drink water. What you drink the day before and the day of has a great effect on your ability to be hydrated and to stay hydrated, which in turn help your body maintain the proper body temperature. You cannot stress this enough to drink water the day before. Um, consuming fluids with high amounts of sugar, such as soda, energy drinks, or anything that's artificially colored will dehydrate you. Alcohol will absolutely dehydrate you. Um, if you got to go on hiking the next day or you're working as your uh, crossing guard tomorrow, lay off the alcohol, as well as caffeine. Caffeine is a diuretic. That basically means that it causes our kidneys to push out sodium and water through our urine. Work in the shade. Um, if you can, find uh, trees or a building to use shade while you're being a crossing guard. You can also create shade with the type of clothing you wear. Fashion, fashion is out on this topic. We don't care what you look like. We're just trying to keep you safe and healthy. So select a wide brimmed hat. Uh, protect your eyes with the proper eyewear. Choose clothing that is light in color and light weighted. Wear a long sleeve shirt to shield, shield the sun's heat and harmful rays off your skin. Uh, long sleeve might sound kind of awkward, but if you notice the guys that do this for a living as far as out doing landscaping, they're not in short sleeves, they're not in tank tops, they're not in shorts. They got pants and long sleeve shirts on. There's a good reason for that. Um, again, weeks prior to um, taking your post as a crossing guard, Get acclimated to the weather. Take those short walks, morning, afternoon. Get used to what we're working in, okay? Um, urine. We just got really personal here. Your urine color can tell a lot about your hydration. If your urine is clear, you're good, but don't stop drinking water, obviously. You always want to keep drinking water through all these. So light color, you might be getting a little behind, keep drinking water. 
bright yellow, orange, dark yellow, that brassy color, you're behind the eight ball. Um, I probably wouldn't do anything real active if I were you. Again, keep hydrating. All right. So even with all of that and you've done everything that you need to do, the next thing that we want you guys to be aware of is just to be sun savvy. Premature aging, changes in your skin texture, cataracts from not keeping your eyes properly protected, and skin cancer. So even though that we're trying to do everything appropriately, we still may end up finding ourselves with different spots on our body that have changed that can be a sign of skin cancer. So any changes you see in your skin, if there's anything that is scaling, oozing, bleeding of a bump or a nodule, um, be especially aware of that. Contact your doctor, your dermatologist, so that way you can be checked. Um, any of your moles that are changing side and the pigmentation has colored outside of the borders. If you're starting to notice a sensation or any itchiness, tenderness, or pain, again, those are all signs that it might be either a precancerous situation that can be easily rectified if you just go ahead and get a hold of your dermatologist and schedule an exam. Um, if you guys have been doing this for years, it's always good to make sure you put on a calendar that you do annual skincare exams with your doctor and also just keeping an eye on your skin just on a daily basis or a monthly basis. Um, with all of that and the prevention, we've already covered what we want to reiterate. Make sure you keep the shirt on, preferably a long sleeve shirt, light colored. Keep on sunscreen. And for sunscreen, there are different levels of, you will see them as an SPF, which is their sun protectant factor. 15 is the least amount that you will ever want to have. And that's just if you're going to be out for a little bit. If you're going to be out any longer than that, you need to use either an SPF of 30 up to 50, which will give you the added protection that you need against the sun rays. According to one of the dermatologists that we were looking at, if you have an SPF of 50, that gives you 90% of protection against the UV burning rays. And with that being said, once you apply it, it does not mean that you are good to go. You need to continue reapplying. The more you sweat, you're wiping your face or your hands or your arms off, you're gonna to have to reapply it just to make sure that you are staying safe. Um, so the number of the SPF indicates how well the sunscreen will protect you against a sunburn. If you have fair skin, freckled skin, very light colored skin, you're gonna to wanna to use the 50 or even higher. You can use that bullfrog on the nose and the ear area. See how that seems like it gets more sun than the rest of our body does. Um, make sure you keep a hat on. The wide brim hats are better than just a regular baseball size. The bigger the brim, the better it's gonna help protect your ears and your nose, your face from getting sunburned. Um, you can also use an umbrella. Uh, stay underneath the tree if you can until you have to help with the little ones walking across the street. And again, always make sure you keep your eyes shaded. Keep sunglasses on. Uh, your final reminders will be, you know, just stay aware, keep with treatment. Um, and the last thing, if you guys have any medications that you are taking or if you have any other illnesses that you may have, Always follow up with your doctor to make sure that medication you take is not going to be affected with you being out in the sun for long periods of time. So we just ask you guys all to be your own advocate to stay safe. Um, try to keep the points that we have given you in the back of your brain to help make sure that everybody goes home safe and stays safe. So at this, we are done with our slide presentation and we can go ahead and go to the chat and we can check any questions and answer as many questions of these as we can. Yeah, um, so we did have a couple questions come in during the presentation. Um, so first, uh, thank you, uh, Chris and Tammy uh, for your presentation, really appreciate it. Um, questions that we had. Um, so I covered this a little bit. Um, is it true that you should cover your body with long sleeve and pants? Um, so, um, and the, the actual question or the follow-up question of that is, does it help you retain sweat more or what's, is there any reason besides just uh, greater uh, sun protection? Uh, it's, it's, it's sun protection, really. Yeah. Um, as far as will retain more sweat, you might, I guess it depends on the material you're, you're, you're wearing, but um, yeah. It's, so you want to make, keep, thank you, Tammy. You want to maintain 
light colored and a lightweight material. So Correct. that may not happen. You use what you can use, but if you have the lightweight and lightweight, lightweight and light colored materials, you should be fine. Yeah, yeah. Cotton tends to um, absorb sweat a bit more, and that can be um, a little bit more difficult. I know that's why like athletic jerseys are usually not cotton, right? Um, and then another item that came up is um, about uh, urine color. Um, so um, I've also heard that you know uh, clear clear urine color means you're good, you're hydrated. Um, some people have heard that maybe a, a lighter yellow, um, like a faint yellow is better because if it's totally clear, you might be flushing out extra minerals. Um, so if you have any thoughts on that, um, feel free to share. Uh, I, you know, I guess uh, light yellow or clear or, or, or both green lights to me. So uh, either way, you're, I think you're, you're on the right way, right track for hydrating. So that, that's the important part. Right. And I would say it's, it's probably better to be overhydrated, right? When you, when you start, because you will be losing a lot of sweat. So I wouldn't be surprised even if you have a, if you, you know, if you, if you check right before and you're clear by the end of your shift, I would be very doubtful if you're still clear. Um, right. So, um, and then I do want to reiterate, this is being recorded. So if, um, any other questions come up later, if you want to refresh or if you missed any part of this, um, you can always uh, check in on the website. Within a few weeks, we should have all of these uh, presentations on, on the website and you can rewatch or uh, read the documentation on them. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, and again, I'll reiterate, uh, get out there in advance, you know, start, start preparing your body uh, to, to experience the heat for so long. Um, most people don't think of crossing guards as athletes, but you do kind of have to prepare in a similar way that most athletes would for, for their work. Um, we, we, want you guys, we want you guys to be safe in order to keep the kids as safe as possible. Can I add something real quick when they were talking about as far as hydration, flushing out all the minerals as well? There, I mean, normally you want to drink at least eight glasses of water a day. If you're outside, you're going to have to increase that. There is a deal where you do drink too much water, you become overhydrated, which can cause more issues. So everybody just needs to kind of monitor that as you go through your day. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, um, and then one other question just came in. I know um, we will be ending very briefly, but we'll be staying. We're in the main room, so we'll we'll be staying here. Um, how do you protect yourselves during monsoons, uh, dust storms, heavy rain? Any any thoughts on that? Kind of the opposite scenario that we've mostly been discussing here. You know, I would say just have the proper um, rain gear for that to happen. Because uh, if you are out there in the middle of monsoon, and I don't know what the schools have regulated for, if there's like a dust storm coming through, like a legit dust, dust storm or a legit monsoon, I would imagine we might be waiting inside a little bit until it passes. So, um, yeah. Hey, Chris, it's Craig. Okay. Up on ahead and close the breakout sessions. Everybody has returned to the main meeting room. Okay, great. Yeah, I think we're, we're all wrapped up here. We got all of our questions done. Um, yeah. Uh, I know next up, we just want to have any closing comments, the final question and answer period. Um, I don't know. Margaret, Don, Brandon, if anyone has any last minute items, um, feel free to chime in. Um, I do see a, uh, a question in the chat about attendance. Um, so we will be uh, sending a list of attendees um, from each session to, to the district administrators. Um, I know some of you may be watching in groups. Uh, we don't have a, a super easy solution for that, but um, we'll, uh, we'll be trying to find a workaround. Um, and yeah, yeah. Thank you all for, for attending. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll turn it over to Don Brennan and Margaret to, to wrap us up, I think. Don and Brandon, did you have anything? I was going to speak to that comment regarding um, 
regarding attendance. So we're gonna do our best. Um, one of the reasons why we ask for so many questions in the registration is so that we could make sure that we could tie you back to your district. Um, in some cases, that's um, a little bit hard to do if you then come into the session with just a single name. So um, we're gonna do our best to, to back check that, but we do have everybody that registered. So we have, we'll have those two lists and, 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 um, and get that done here in the next couple of weeks. Um, I thought maybe one of the things that we could do, Brandon and Don, if you don't have anything, there, were, there may have been a question that I was not able to address during the um, laws regarding crosswalks. And I might, um, if, if you want me to, I can probably address that right now. I really tried and I, I apologize, really tried to get everybody's questions answered. It was um, somewhat challenging when the question was really long. So, um, but, but we do wanna get your questions answered. Um, one of the attendees had a question about the speed feedback signs, if the crossing guards are responsible for changing those or turning them on or turning them off. Um, and the answer to that is um, no, the crossing guards are only responsible for the signs that are rolled out if you um, operate a crossing that has the rollout signs. Um, other than that, it's your responsibility really is your own safety and the safety of the kids. Um, the local agency that maintains the right of way are the ones who um, maintain those speed feedback signs. So I don't know, Dory, if you had any other questions that um, maybe you weren't able to answer in your breakout sessions. So Brandon was monitoring those pretty well and answering them as they came, correct? I believe you were able to do that. Yeah, I, I will say there was one comment um, about uh, an, another state or city where they do live demonstrations. Uh, there are two reasons it's not practical right now. Uh, one of them is the very reason we're on Zoom. But if you are, need more of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, assistance at your location, it really depends on your district and which city you're in, but I would encourage you to contact your principal and ask if there are other resources. Um, if you're in Phoenix, for example, Don, I know Don is out there, um, although for, we don't know how much, how much <laughs> longer Don. What's that? A few months left. Few, uh, for a few more months, so, so act quick. Um, in Peoria, I know the uh, Peoria Unified School District um, has some some individuals that uh, that go out and, and I do on, on occasion go out and work with individuals as well. So it depends on your location if you need additional help specific to your location. And one note about portable signs. Uh, almost every city, it's the school or school district's responsibility to furnish those portable signs, except Phoenix. So if they're lost, stolen, damaged, uh, you would contact the city of Phoenix to get those replaced. Yeah, so if your signs end up being stolen, um, for us to replace them, we're going to need a police report. So you would have your, your staff uh, contact uh, the police precinct in your school area um, to write up the police report and have a number that you could send to us. And then I'm able to ask for the signs to be replaced at that point. If you have any Phoenix specific questions about your school area, you can contact me. I think uh, our email contacts are still in here, right, Margaret? I'm sorry, Don, I was responding to a question. <laughs> Oh, so um, people uh, have our email addresses, right? Correct. It's in the it's in the um, booklet that's available at the web page, and I posted that link again. The srts.azmag.gov. The very first page is um, contact information for both the engineering departments for each city and town, as well as uh, the police department. Excellent. So you can find us that way, and we will respond uh, as quickly as we can. Um, and kind of along those lines, there is another question here regarding the agreement. Um, if you have questions about the written agreement that we talked about during the laws regarding crosswalks breakout session, 
um, I would have your principal talk to the um, district transportation administrator. Um, that's an agreement between that entity as well as the local agency. So that's who you would, um, that would kind of be the avenue for you to ask questions regarding the written agreement. Well, Thank our you main purpose busy. here is to uh, equip you to keep yourselves safe, to keep the kids safe. We thank you for what you're doing. Uh, we know you're not doing it for, for fame and fortune, um, but out of a, a real desire to do something good for the community. And so we thank you for that. We hope you have a wonderful school year and um, hopefully it'll cool down quickly. <laughs> Great, yeah. Agreed. Um, again, uh, that website is in the chat um, and all of this information will be on the website. Again, within a few weeks, we should have it up in English and Spanish. Um, I think with that, we can go ahead and close a few minutes early even unless um, there are more questions rolling in. There is, there's a question here. Can we leave our signs out throughout the school hours on the 12th and Rose Lane? So I'm not familiar with that, if it's a budding or not. The answer is yes. Yeah, that's a city of Phoenix thing, and I, and Don, that's a Don Cross's domain. I wrote the agreement, so yes, absolutely. So if it's a budding, just in general, it's though, a if it's a if it's a budding to the school, then yes, you can leave it out. Except if it's well, on an arterial street. Except if it's a major street. Down. Yeah. Good point. That's the only exception. So, I mean, that brings up a good point. If you're unsure, uh, you know, reach out to uh, you know your schools to get in touch with the uh, city engineers and uh, they'll be able to find out for you. So it's always better to be safe than sorry. So, All right, everyone. Uh, appreciate all of your time um, and appreciate you all uh, taking the stand to keep the children safe in the region. Um, this is a really important program um, and we're really grateful that you all step up to the plate to, to help us out. Um, and with that, I think, uh, Craig, we can go ahead and end the meeting, I, I believe. Um, doesn't look like any other questions are coming in. And um, yeah, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.